Abhishek, uh, Mr. Bachchan, I'm uh, relieved that all eyes are on you right now, rather than me, so I'm relieved. <laughs> and uh, and uh, to be very honest, I have never seen this kind of attendance in my classes. <laughs> and uh, I happen to be a very popular teacher, but still, this is uh, really awesome. So thank you everyone for coming to this uh, gathering over here. So, uh, Abhishek, is this your uh, first time in an Indian stock management? Yes, uh, first of all, uh, good evening now. Uh, <laughs> my apologies for being slightly late. Uh, the flight got me late and then uh, I thought I was driving to another state because it took a long time, but uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time actually. Uh, let me see if I get the pronunciation right. Cody code. Cody code. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. That, that's what you call starting with a bang. Yeah. yeah, it is my first time, and it's wonderful. I'm, I'm actually very envious and jealous of all of you all. Oh, uh, uh, what let, a beautiful let, campus. It's, yeah, and what a view. So let me uh, drive a little bit deeper. Beautiful in what sense, Savishik? Pardon me? Beautiful in what sense, Savishik? We have the high. Wonderful looking ladies over here. They're all beautiful. They're let, all beautiful. Let me remind you for the And benefit. the view is also very nice. Well, that comes to, you know. Yeah. Let me remind you you are married. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's but, also beautiful. Right. <laughs> uh, Avishik, how does it feel to be in an IM amongst uh, uh, professors, directors, and researchers, all very serious and intimidating people? How does it feel? Are you scared? Should I be scared? Uh, the news reports tell us that you are scared. I'm um, anxious. Yeah, I think, you know, you're amongst some of the brightest minds in the country. And um, it's not, I wouldn't say intimidating, but uh, anxious. Yeah, I think, you know, I want the session to go well. Um, these are some of the people here, I mean, that form the today of India, the policy makers, thinkers, and... Uh, we have a lot of students here who are going to go on and become decision makers in our country. So, um, yeah, I, I hope uh, we don't disappoint. I think any actor has stage fright. Oh. So, um, yeah, I've, I've, I have my fair share of stage fright. <laughs> How are you? Are you feeling intimidated? Uh, well, uh, intimidated a lot because I'm only 5 feet 11 and you are 6 feet 4. But three, other than three. that, you know, <laughs> I work out also, you know. Yeah? Yeah. How much do you bench? How much do I bench? I bench uh, 150 pounds. How much do you bench? Uh, let's just say a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> All right. The first question to you, Abhishek. Uh, there is a popular perception that uh, commercial Hindi cinema has borrowed generously from Western cinema. Uh, first of all, I want your views on this. And if this is correct, and I, we want to know how this view can be changed. Um, I. Uh, grudgingly have to agree but I think they do as well and uh, we're a huge I think there's a creative community in the world and borrowing ideas from each other is fine um, yeah so I'm not good I think it would be incorrect of me to say that a lot of um, Indian films don't uh, liberally borrow from um, from from the West but I think they do as well I mean, um, who's seen this movie called Pearl Harbor? It's Sangam. Have you seen Sangam? Raj Kapoor Sangam? Same story. You know, uh, Titanic was burning train on water. It's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> you know? So, um, I think it, there, there, there's a fair amount of exchange. I, as long as it's done on, uh, legally, I think it's fine. It's permissible, and what's really nice is, uh, you know, initially the, there were a lot of the copyright laws in India were very ambiguous, and uh, now that they're more sorted out, and with the, you know the the coming in of a lot of foreign studios, there's a lot more vigilance, and um, I think now what is happening is whenever you do want to make a film, you see, we're all creative people. You want to, you see a film, you get inspired by it. You want to make it in your context, in your language. Fair enough. Buy the rights, do it. That's what everybody's doing today, and I think that's a very healthy trend. Okay. Um, there are a lot of uh, our films that have gone abroad um, and have been remade. Um, a very dear friend of mine, Uday Chopra, 
um, has bought the rights of Shujoy Ghosh's Kahani and he's making it in Hollywood oh. as an English film. Um, I remember at one point of time, um, you know, Raju Rani's first film, Munnava MBBS, was going to be made. Uh, so it's, a lot of this happens, and I think it's a very healthy thing to do. Uh, the exchange of, of, of talent um, is good. It helps, um, it helps a person broaden their horizons and grow. Okay, so that clarifies. Uh, Abhishek, my second question to you would be, uh, what do you think is unique about Bollywood, the industry from which you, are, uh, you belong, It sets it apart from that of Hollywood? I'd, I'd much rather talk about Indian cinema in general as opposed just to Bollywood, because um, although I'm not a huge fan of the word Bollywood, I think it's, um, it's a bit... We know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I prefer to call it Indian cinema, but Bollywood kind of refers now purely to Hindi cinema. And um, Indian cinema is a lot more than just Hindi cinema. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Malayali cinema is huge. And um, unfortunately, this word Bollywood has now been put into the dictionary, so we can't run away from it, so you just have to accept it. Uh, but we should know why it was coined in the first place. It was coined almost as um, in a very condescending manner. Um, and that's why a lot of actors don't appreciate the word. But now it's part of the dictionary, and if that's an easier way to communicate, then so be it. Um, but I think what's unique about Indian cinema and what differentiates it from any other cinema in the world, not just Hollywood, um, is, I think, basically, Indian cinema is escapist by nature. Most of our stories, the majority of them, although that majority is being depleted slowly, but uh, we're escapist by nature. Um, you have three hours of pure entertainment, um, and our films are, I think, very similar to our food. You know, it's like a thali. You have everything, something spicy, something sweet, something salty, everything. So we have romance. There's, I mean, it's very difficult to categorize an Indian film as, oh, it's just a romance. No, but there's going to be comedy, there's going to be action, there's going to be drama. So we like everything. Um, Indians are very all-rounded people. You know, we don't, um, we're, we're not bland by any nature. And my apologies to anybody who's not Indian over here. Uh, but your food is really bad, sorry. Um, <laughs> and um, so I think our cinema kind of reflects our culture. Also, um, if you see Indian culture historically has been um, a very musical culture. Our storytelling is very lyrical and music-based. Even our scriptures, our holy scriptures, are written in, a, um, you know, in some sort of meter. Um, they're recited through song. Um, so there's a huge musical culture which comes down in our, in our storytelling heritage, which um, is reflective in our cinema, uh, which is very different from other, um, other industries. And um, I really think there's a lot of poetic justice that comes into our stories, which is not very prevalent in the West. Um, there are a lot of these factors that go into it, and I think that stems from, from the kind of people that we are. Uh, we're not a very rich nation. Yet, uh, you know, once these guys get out there, I'm sure they'll make a big difference and, and change that. But, uh, yeah. So, um, you know, you, my, my grandfather um, was a very prominent poet. And he used to tell me, I remember as a child, that um, the greatness about Indian cinema is that um, a man who's toiled very hard all day in the sun um, can go into a dark theater where it's nice and cool, have something small to eat, uh, watch something which is very escapist and aspirational and receive poetic justice within three hours, something which he might not get in his entire life. Um, so I really think that the kind of emotions and the, the, the pomp and pageantry of Indian cinema is something which is very unique to us. And it's something that we should hold very dear. Um, in a day and age where the world is really shrinking and um, borders are being blurred, uh, creatively as well as politically, um, I think this is the one thing we should really hold on to because I think that's what sets us apart. And the reason people are enjoying Indian cinema globally today is not just because of the kind of subject matter, it's because we really celebrate our cinema. Um, there, is a very unique, there is a unique quality to Indian cinema which is not prevalent anywhere in any other cinema. So you know the song and the dance and the melodrama, uh, we all love it. Uh, we, you know, I was educated from the age of nine in a, you know, in a British boarding school. Mm. Uh, my upbringing was very British, and my sensibility and my education was British. 
And uh, for all practical purposes, you know, I was no different to any of my British counterparts. But when you watch a typical masala Indian film, it just, you know, it kind of invigorates you. It just, it just, it just, it's something that is almost ingrained in us, which is very hard to explain. So there might not be any logic to it, but it's just an emotion that carries you through it. Okay. Uh, moving along, Avishek, uh, would you tell us... Uh, I talk a lot, guys, okay, so <laughs> get comfortable. <laughs> I am accustomed to that because my father talks a lot as well, so, you know. Right, so now and I'm he's like here in the audience, by the way. He's calling me his father. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Avishek, uh, uh, So have you finished all your homework? Uh, have you? <laughs> That's uh, one of the questions I uh, wish to ask as well, because there was news, you know, news articles that you were very nervous about coming to an IM. So I was about to ask you, did you take any pointers from your dad? Before oh, coming in, to in stuff like this? Absolutely not. No? He's, wor he's worse than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm overconfident compared to my dad. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Vishik, a few things that the Western cinema can learn from us. What would those things be? Good question. <laughs> I think there's, there's... Come on, you have to answer this. Well, first of all, they, they should learn how to shoot a song, because I don't think anybody shoots songs like we do. I think it's great. <laughs> you know, um, one, of, one of my most embarrassing moments in um, my career, which I will never forget, but was also one of the most educating to me, was um, my first film had not released. A refugee, and I was shooting another film simultaneously called Tera Jadu Chal Gaya. All right, and um, I, I, my boarding school was in Switzerland, and we were shooting a song in Switzerland, which was this surreal experience for me because the film is based in Agra, <laughs> and I'm playing like this scout from Agra, and suddenly I see this girl, slight out focus, cut bang, we're in Switzerland. I'm like. <laughs> This is it, man. This is why you do the films, you know, to do stuff like this. But, you know, obviously, you know, having studied drama and all, through in English, Shakespeare in English and all of that, suddenly to be wearing this green Sherwani and be dancing in Switzerland with 50 dancers from Chennai dressed up as Roman warriors. <laughs> you have to be smoking something really cool to enjoy that, you know? So, so, so. So I, I was like, wow, you know, what, what's going on over here? And, and, and suddenly I said, instead of fighting this, just surrender to it and enjoy it. Here we are. I'm a character called Kabir from Agra. I've seen this girl. I've transported and teleported myself to Switzerland in the snow. I'm wearing a Sherwani in the snow. I have 50 Chennai-based Roman soldiers behind me. <laughs> in a PVC costume and fake swords, and I'm singing this unbelievably romantic song, which is Ed Chan Teri Chand Niki Kasam. <laughs> and in the background, these Roman soldiers are doing, I, I was like, you, you can't make stuff like that up, you know? It's just fantastic. And you'd never get to, and you know the great thing is you pull it off and people believe it, it and nobody questions it. Nobody questions it, and it's just fantastic. So I think that's something they can learn from us. I mean, not how to take Chennai-based uh, uh, Roman soldiers to Switzerland, but just, you know, the kind of unbelievability of Indian cinema and the conviction with which we make it. I still remember my father did one of my favorite films of his, is a movie called Amar Akbar Anthony, right? And in the title sequence, you have three estranged brothers who've all grown up. One's a police officer, one's a gunda, and one's a singer. And they find this one lady who's had this accident, who happens to be her mother, but they don't know. <laughs> and they're giving Nirupa Royji blood at the same time. Three of them. <laughs> so the song, and you know, she's there uh, unconscious, and they're all there with this one red thing. And all three of them, it all goes directly into her. And you know, it's like, ye to uske, you know, bete hai, and she doesn't know, and you're so in that moment that the logic of it doesn't seem to matter, you know? I mean, uh, medical students would be passing out over there. But it, you just believe it, it's fantastic. 
And I remember Manmohan Desai, who directed that film, was my all-time favorite director. He used to tell me uh, when I was a kid, we were on the sets of one of my dad's films called Mard. And he was telling me, you know, I'm, I'm the world's greatest scientist and medical practitioner. So I was like, and he was saying this in Hindi, and, and he, he spoke um, in very colorful language, let's just put it that way. Um, and I'll, I'll say it in English. And he said, you know, I made this uh, movie called Naseeb, in which Nirupa Roy, who, who's a perennial mother to all these films, um, <laughs> she, um, her, her family's going through a lot of financial troubles. She's been diagnosed with tuberculosis. She's going to die because they don't have, you know, money for medication. So she decides to run away and kill herself, not to burden her family and her three sons. Okay. So she, in this dramatic letter that she writes, and the background is showing her running, and there's a storm, and it's raining, and there's lightning, and lightning hits a tree. The tree hits her on the head. She passes out. <laughs> he says, that's great. So I said, why? He says, because... This tree hits her on the head, she goes blind, but her TB miraculously gets cured. <laughs> and, I wish and he said, till date, they're looking for that tree, that where is this tree? Just hit all the TB patients with it. <laughs> Somehow. Uh, so, you know, that unbelievability and the conviction with which we make our films. Yeah, I like the word unbelievability, but the point is, I'm having a feeling that you're suggesting that all of us are fools in a way. No. <laughs> no not at all. Not at all. Not I'm at sure. all. I think, no, it's the conviction with which you go in. I think it's, you're going to try and say, oh, it's something fool. You see, at that, the great thing about cinema is that you surrender to the moment at that point of time. You're not questioning it. The, everything about cinema is about submitting. From submitting your money at the box office <laughs> to submitting your money to the concession stand, then you go into this huge dark room where the screen is always slightly above you, so you're, again, you're looking up to it. You're, the lights go down, and suddenly, in a sense, you cease to exist as a person. You're, you know, in a, uh, sitting next to a complete stranger, you don't know who that person is, but you bear your soul. If, that, if you're emotional at that point in time, you will cry. You don't care who's looking at you. Um, and everything about cinema is to submit to that. And if a, the, the true test of a great film and a great director is if they can take you on this ride and you don't question it. Mm. You know, um, nobody questions some of the stuff that Steven Spielberg does. Um, nobody questions a lot of these great directors. You have to be able to entertain. Entertainment is about forgetting your problems and just being told a story that is wonderful. I sincerely hope our students have this kind of attention and submission in our classes. Uh, Avishik, moving on, uh, do you think, uh, in your opinion, Bollywood is the right vehicle to globalize Indian thought? If so, why? You know, I think it's been doing it for a long time. Um, I, I really do believe that Indian cinema has been a wonderful ambassador to, to India. Um, we take our culture out to the West, we take our, our stories to the West, we take our talent out to the West, in, and when I say to the West, they, they see it. Um, what I think has been very unique in the last 15 to 20 years is I think, you know, India drastically changed in the early 90s. Obviously, there were policy decisions that were made politically, but I really think there was this, the advent of satellite television just revolutionized the, the country. Um, we had one Doordarshan, which also didn't play 24 hours. Um, and um, suddenly, you know, India was exposed to the West, Western content, Western thought, Western culture. Uh, and that started radicalizing a lot of change in India. And what started happening in our cinema, if you see in the late 90s with the Dilwale Dhuraniya Le Jayenge and Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, suddenly they were, you know, that was the epitome of what is perceived as cool. And that was very Western. Mm. And that's when this whole trend in India started where a lot of the films were made for the so-called NRIs. Mm -hmm. You know, everything was, everybody goes to London and you're going abroad and you're shooting um, with Romans standing at the back. And, um, you know, everything was based towards introducing India to what the West is all about. And this is how it's done, and this is how you dress, and this is the kind of lingo you use, and like that. What I see happening in the last four, three to four years is we're becoming Desi again. I think there's a lot more comfort in who we are. Um, Indians have become comfortable in their own skin. We're not aspiring to be, to, to please the, the whole, what I call the British complex, you know? Um, I think Indians are finally coming into their own, and that also largely has a lot to do with the fact that um, as, as an economy, I think India is doing very well and is influencing a lot of uh, international policies. Hence, 
I think there's a lot more pride in just being in India where previously people were, you know, almost apologetic about it or, you know, servile about it. I think today, the, the, you know, as we say in, in Bombay, Chati Thokke Jati, that, yeah, you know, we're here, this is our cinema, this is our art, this is uh, our education system, this is everything about us that's very cool. And suddenly being Desi has become very cool. So if you see in our cinema as well now, everything is turning back to more rural India, a lot more films. I mean, if you see, um, how can I give you a good example? Um, have you all seen this movie called Dabang? Yeah. yeah? How cool was it? Right? And it's a very Desi film. Uh, you know, they're not trying to, to try and emulate the West in any which way. And I think if you see, a lot of these kind of cinemas are now just very comfortable being who they are. We're not trying to show that this is how you should be. This is what we are like and it's cool. So I see that there's a lot more comfort in our cinema about who we are, about where we come from. And that is what is making, is really penetrating globally for us. Uh, Abhishek, let me uh, quote a few figures, which is from Ernst Young uh, Industrial Report. Uh, Hollywood films take typically 36 months to plan and 12 months to execute, whereas a typical Bollywood movie takes six months to plan and 18 months to execute. What are your thoughts on this? Okay. <laughs> That's a strategic move to, uh, you know, divert the attention. But since being a professor, I'm not going to let you go. Okay. And uh, we have professors from the operations area who are sitting here and could tell, uh, tell us that this is basically lousy planning and lousy execution. Hmm. And from a management point of view. All right. Um, some of them would be right. Uh, in some cases, they could be wrong. Uh, see, I'm a producer as well, so I, I traditionally like six to eight months of pre-production. Um, you know, the markets are completely different. I think you've got to evaluate that first, all right? Um, That's a global answer, by the way. <laughs> no, no, they are. See, you have to understand that in, say, uh, Hollywood, so to speak. I think in Hollywood they do that. I don't think any other cinema, be it French or German or Iranian, would take that so long to in pre-production. Hmm. Um, the people you're catering to is different. Hollywood is catering to a global market. We're catering to a predominantly an Indian diaspora of sorts. Um, there is a language barrier. English is more hmm. widely spoken than hmm. Hindi is. Hmm. Um, and I'm only quoting Hindi because it is the, the largest in terms of penetration globally. Um, as compared to the other languages spoken in India. Um, so I think you have to adapt your preparation. Um, there's certain films that literally go on close within a month. There's certain films that take three years to be planned. I'm sure. Uh, they yeah. Hit. yeah. You'd oh. be shocked. Okay. You'd be shocked. Uh, I just uh, released a film called Happy New Year, mm -hmm. which we were planning for two years. Oh, okay. Um, you know, and when they, when they, I think when Ernst Young is saying about 36 months, that includes scripting. I'm not, you know, our pre-production doesn't include scripting. Our pre-production okay. starts once the script is locked. Um, so basically Hollywood we are spends a lot of time in, in scripting, in developing a mm -hmm. script, in green lighting. For example, um, you know, James Cameron made this beautiful film called Avatar, which he spent 12 years preparing for. And then he spent four years shooting it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it all depends on script to script, uh, project to project, and also the market you're catering to. Uh, America has to take into account, they have a huge overseas market. In some of their bigger films, their overseas market constitutes a larger chunk of their pie than the domestic market, where in India it's completely the reverse. You have to worry about the domestic market, and the overseas comes is a secondary market. Um, and see, also, um, Indian cinema is emerging globally as a market as well. I mean, mm -hmm. in the last four years, we've opened up markets like Poland, Brazil. Uh, suddenly, the GEC countries have has mm. become the number one earner for you, where previously it was only America and UK, and those are the only two centers you released your films. The UK is almost stagnating as a market. America has opened up, especially for Telugu cinema, and I think that's because there's been such a huge uh, influx of a lot of IT people going abroad and working there. So Telugu cinema is, is doing almost comparable business to Hindi cinema, which was not the case before. So it's still a market which, in which we're finding our feet. Um, then you have non-traditional markets, like I said, uh, Japan, Brazil, which have become huge. So, you know, you have to, uh, we're not considering 
are, we're not making our films think, keeping those markets in mind, whereas America has to keep all these factors in mind. Okay. Uh, so I think that could be why. And also I think they've re written this because um, they, they're including scripting in that, which are, are pre-production stuff. But like I said, you know, the longer you spend, the better it is. I, I'd, I'd much rather have as much time doing pre-production and a shorter time executing the film. Um, even in this, in this report, if they've said it's, they take, what, 12 months to execute? Actually, um, what I think that what they mean by execute is to release the film. Yes. Um, you know, Hollywood traditionally shoots the film between six to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, we now, in the current scenario, shoot a film between an average uh, film, uh, between two to four months, and you're, and you're out. Okay. And then the rest of it, they get into promotion and you know, post-production and stuff like that. So yes, I do believe that the more time you get to prepare, the better. But again, it depends what kind of a film you're making. Is it um, time sensitive in the sense if today I have an idea that I'm going to um, you know, write a film on something that is happening currently. I can't wait two years to Absolutely. start making that film. So it all, it all depends. Uh, moving on, Abhishek, uh, we would like to talk about your role as a producer. And uh, if you can share some of your thoughts and experiences in producing PASS. It's yeah. a very special film, I guess. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, you know, I'm not a producer at heart. I don't actually enjoy it. Um, it kind of conflicts with me, the actor, because um, both the professions kind of counter each other and cancel each other off. You know, <laughs> the, the actor in me wasn't allowing the producer in me to do, do my job properly, mm. whereas I should be concerned about bringing the film in on budget, bringing it in on time, and still maintaining the quality of the product. The actor in me just wanted more time and wanted to spend more money when I did not have that kind of money mm -hmm. because that was the budget I'd set for the film. Mm. Um, but I, I had a very systematic approach to it. Um, as a producer, I, look my, I try and look at my films very dispassionately. Um, the reason for making the film has to be passionate, but once you get down to the drawing board, you have to be able to emotionally cut off from the film and treat it as a business venture. Um, with regards to Pa, the subject was something which was not run of the mill, it was different. Mm. Um, it was a subject which traditionally nobody has seen or we would get. So it was something that uh, Balki, who directed the film and I decided that we'd try and keep it as controlled a budget as possible. Uh, we set out a budget of, of 20 crores for that film, uh, including P&A, which is, which is print and advertising. Um, and uh, we managed to bring in the film at 17. Oh, okay. And um, it kind of helps when you're Father is in the film, and he's, he's not allowed to earn any money off the film, so <laughs> he kind of did me a favor. But um, so I spent a lot of time in on on the budget and the execution. I didn't enjoy it because, like I said, it, it you know because I was acting in the film, mm. um, that was kind of countering what I wanted to do. Um, but it's like I said, I I spent a lot of time on the budget and figuring it out, and and my pre-production, my production team spends a lot of time. Um, you know, doing their recce and just being absolutely prepared because I believe, I believe that when I'm a producer, I don't believe this when I'm an actor, but mm -hmm. as a producer, I believe that on set, you should be just executing your job. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be creating at that point of time. Um, the creation has to happen before you get on, on floors. Um, you know, film parlance is when you're on floors, means when you're shooting the film. Mm -hmm. It literally has to be executing. And at that point of time, I don't, as a producer, have the liberty to allow anybody to have creative freedom. Mm. So if you have decided to shoot two pages a day, and by the end of the day, um, you only canned one page because you know the actors want to try it in different, different ways, I have to take a call at that point of time. And at that point of time, I need to be emotionally removed enough from the film to say, OK, you're up. What you got is what you get, and that's it. And um, the actor in me would obviously want more time to carry on because it is a creative medium as well. Mm. Um, so as a producer, I have no problem handling the execution part of it. Uh, as an actor, I have a huge problem um, with it, yeah. Uh, going forward, uh, do you think that you're going to play a larger role in filmmaking now that you are an actor, you have produced a couple of films, many films actually. So going forward, do we, are we going to get to see you as a filmmaker? Uh, I, I hope not. Uh, I, I don't know direction. It's very difficult. Uh, and in keeping my attention span in mind, I think I'd be a terrible director. Um, yeah, I like acting. You know, I'm, I'm good at receiving instruction. Um, and I'm good at providing an environment to make a film. 
direction is, is, is not something I, I don't even think about it. I don't think about those lines that, you know, maybe one day. I, I don't know. Maybe 20 years down the line, I'll have something to say, and I want to make a film that way. I don't want to say never. But currently, the, the state of mind I'm in, no, I, I've never really thought about it. Abhishek, uh, we have seen you in uh, many uh, fun roles, like as Bunty or in a serious roles as uh, Jai Dixit, but there are other roles which you have also uh, got and played uh, that of Bridge Bhushan in Antor Mahal uh, with Ritu Porno. So it's a very different role, uh, you know, typically what we see you in Bollywood movies. So how difficult is, is it for an actor like you to manage the two sides of the story, a very serious uh, role as Bridge Bhushan or, you know, the other <laughs> as Bunty? Well, Antar Mahal is something I did um, for Rituda, who um, is a very, very old family friend. And um, he said, I'll make a movie with you in 15 days. I said, OK. And that was it. Um, I, I actually read the script on the flight to Kolkata to shoot the film. And, um, but I think that's kind of what keeps it exciting to be an actor, that you get to do a, a variety of roles, you get to play a variety of characters. I think it'd be terribly boring if I just played the same character in every film over and over again. For me, I mean, it would be excruciating for the audience, but for me as well, as a creative person, to wake up every morning, be inspired to go out of work, um, it's good that things keep changing up. Say hi from me. Oh, you, you just snitched on him, huh? Say him, not me. <laughs> so, Everything okay? Okay, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's, it's what I keeps it exciting. I generally throw them out of class if they do that in my class. Oh, no, no, it's cool. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to. I, I, yeah. I understand. We need, we need to keep them on the seats. For an actor, it's important. <laughs> be on your phone, be on your website. Come, buy a ticket, that's all. <laughs> uh, so, it's, 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 it's exciting. Um, if you're asking me, um, from an acting perspective, how is it? Um, it's difficult, it's challenging, but that's the way it should be. I think it would be very uh, boring if, if it all came very easily to you. I think you, as an actor, I like to take my next job as, as a film, which is something I perhaps haven't done before. I mean, barring the few sequels that I've done. Um, but it has to be a new challenge. It has to be something as an actor which you feel, okay, this is going to give me sleepless nights, and this is something I'm going to have to work really hard on. Okay. Uh, Abhishek, we would now like to move on to something else which you have been involved in recently. You're, uh, and I guess you're very passionate about that enterprise of yours. Uh, uh, you have certainly given Kabaddi a new name in India and in the international yes. forum. And, uh, <laughs> and why, uh, uh, why uh, this is important is because uh, this game is very humble and it belongs, you know, it originates from rural India and uh, actors like you and personalities like you giving it a position in Wall Street. That's commendable first. Thank you. But given that, uh, uh, I would like to ask you what made you to, you know, conceptualize and get into this business of... Uh, um. <clears throat> About two years ago, Charu Sharma, um, you all know Charu Sharma, is a very famous commentator, right? So Charu um, met me socially at, at, at some dinner. And um, he said, hey, I know you're a big football fan. Um, he follows me on, on Twitter. And he said, I know you're a big football fan. Have you ever thought of you know, doing something with some other sport? I said, what sport? He said, Kabaddi. And that was like a bit, you know, left field for me. I'm like, what? Kabaddi, people still play Kabaddi, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's something we used to play in school and, you know, when you were kids. So he said, yeah, and um, would you be interested in something like this? And I said, yeah, why not? But, you know, he says, would you like to see? I said, yeah, you know, it's, if you've modernized the sport or whatever, he said, yeah, it's a completely different sport from what we remember. Hmm. And he took me to a Kabaddi match and I was blown away that there were 10,000 people watching this one match. And it was played on mats, and there were these really athletic guys, and it was high energy. It was exciting to watch. And um, I was just blown away by it. I said, you know, why has nobody thought of doing something with this? He said, well, I am, and I'm putting together a league, and would you be interested in it? 
Mm. And it, very honestly, there's a very instinctive reaction that, yeah, this is something you just have to do. You know when you see something, it just clicks and you know that this is right? Um, it was just that. It, kind of, it literally fell on my lap. And uh, then we set about putting the league together and then obviously we had the other franchisees come on. I was very clear that um, what was my goal in Kabaddi was, I'd, I'd like to believe it was noble on some level, but also, you know, you wanted to make a difference. Um, so I was very keen to take up a team in a place where the infrastructure for sports wasn't um, as good mm. as they would be in, in some of the metro cities. So I chose Jaipur. Um, you know, Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, <coughs> Vaisak, these all have, have nice infrastructure for, for sports. Um, Patna, Jaipur don't really. Um, so I chose Jaipur and we set about doing the groundwork for it. And um, I still remember before the league started and everybody was very nervous because, you know, D-Day was coming up and suddenly the audience was going to see it. And, you know, I thought Star TV did an absolutely brilliant job marketing, um, you know, the entire Kabaddi League. And I, I was speaking to some of the executives at Star and I said, um, you know, what is a good number of viewers to know that, okay, we've done a good job? And uh, they said, look, we've set a very aggressive benchmark for ourselves. Um, we are hoping that we get to hit 50 million viewers. I said, um, is that doable? So they said, it's doable. Um, it's going to be tough, but it's doable. But we want, you know, we've put in so much effort into it. We want to be aggressive. And um, if we hit 50 million, we're through. And I guarantee you that a second season will happen. Uh, this was at a stage when nobody even knew if we could sustain the Pro Kabaddi League. And um, what blew everybody away was, I think it just made such a huge impact uh, when it started, that before the end of the first season as well, I mean, you, in, in a place like Mumbai, which is like, you know, the birthplace of Indian cricket almost, you know, um, and every nukkar, every gully, everybody's playing cricket. And suddenly I'd be driving somewhere and people would be playing kabaddi on the streets, to in the societies, to in schools. You know, I'd, I'd stop at a traffic light and people, you know, in a rickshaw next to me would say, hey, Sci-5, Sci-5. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing to see it resonate so well. And, um, you know, setting out a figure of 50 million viewers and by the end of the season, which was six weeks, uh, Kabaddi actually, we hit 493 million viewers. And that's... <laughs> and, um, you know, the very same sponsors that we were running after to come and give us some money to to sponsor our teams um, who refused to come on board were now calling us saying, hey, can we be associated in season two? So it just goes to show that how much it, it resonated with the Indian people. I think the reason for this is that it's, it's widely played. Um, and I was under the same misconception that, that Kabaddi is, is a rural sport. Um, and I told Ch Charu this, that you know, it's predominantly a rural sport that's played more in northern India. And he said, uh, well, first and foremost, Kabaddi is a derivative of a Tamil word, which is Kaipiddi, which is to hold hands. Um, it is played pan-India. Um, the Kabaddi Federation has uh, state teams from each and every state. And um, he says, in Mumbai City, how many Kabaddi clubs do you think there are? So I said, okay, this is a trick question. So I acted over smart. I said, 50. So he said, no. 1,500. <laughs> it's just something we just don't know. We, we just hadn't put the spotlight onto Kabaddi. It's, you know, it's, it's there. The people are playing it. And just the way I think the success of the Pro Kabaddi League goes to show that it's a very popular sport. Yes, it's very television friendly. I think they packaged it brilliantly. Um, but they made a product which was exciting to watch. And it's a product that people know about. Hmm. Um, so I just think it was more about just bringing it into the limelight. And, um, you know, we're, we're thankful. We, uh, due to the success of it now, we have the next season starting in March, and now it's going to be a biannual event mm. as opposed to just, um, you know, once a year. And, um, yeah, so now everybody's preparing for the second season, and, uh, you know, they're very, very bullish about it. They're confident about it because I think we've got, again, like I said, similar to films, we found something that's very desi and it's very cool. This is our sport. Um, this is India's indigenous sport. It's over 3,000 years old. It has, it's, you know, you can trace back its origins to the Mahabharat. 
Um, that is, I mean, that's why you have one raider against seven, because it it's goes, goes back to the origins of Abhimanyu and the Chakra view. That's the actual origins of how Kabaddi started. There was one Abhimanyu, there were seven Chakra views, and that's how it all started off. So it's, it's, it's an ancient sport that's been played throughout. Um, I mean, apart from some of your younger students, I'm sure at least most of your faculty, we've all played Kabaddi as kids, you know? And um, so it's another look at, in terms of cinema, where Sunny is becoming cool to be Desi again. This is our own sport and it's ours and we're good at it. We're the undisputed champions. Uh, we've never lost a World Cup. There have been five World Cup Kabaddis. Uh, and to put in perspective, more nations play Kabaddi than they do cricket. Uh, 35 nations play Kabaddi <laughs> worldwide. And India has never lost the World Cup. We've never lost the gold at the Asian Games. So we're good at it. It's ours and it's, it's cool. Uh, Abhishek, uh, uh, let me uh, ask you, if you have to uh, take Kabaddi uh, to, to an international forum, what would uh, the steps that you need to take? Well, I think first and foremost, because this is stuff we've all discussed, we've got a business plan for it. Um, the first step is to get a very strong and sound foundation in India. Hmm. There is another Kabaddi league, uh, which is of a different style of Kabaddi called Ring Kabaddi, which is being played internationally. Um, I don't know how well it's done or how it's not done. Um, but the idea is, see, we have a lot of foreign players already in the Pro Kabaddi League. Um, it was mandatory that in every team, the eight teams, that you have to have three foreign players. Um, and we, in my team, we had a Nepalese, we had a, a guy from Taiwan. Mm. Um, you know, we had Koreans, we have Iranians, Afghanis, uh, Nigerians, Kenyans, Britishers, Canadians. Americans, they all play um, Kabaddi. Denmark, Iceland has just signed up with the World Kabaddi Federation. So um, the interest is growing, but the interest will peak when they have a structure to come through. So you have the Pro Kabaddi League. I think the next step will be for the franchises to start setting up academies, uh, especially a youth academy. So, you know, kids feel they have a, a complete structure to go through, play for the local team in the Pro Kabaddi League and then graduate on to the Indian team. Once you have this kind of structure coming through is when you have international interest coming into it. There's already a huge amount of interest. Mm. And I think with the success of the Pro Kabaddi League, suddenly a lot of people internationally have started waking up and are talking about it. Uh, I mean, for CNN to do a half-hour program on what is Kabaddi, mm. it just goes to prove that people are interested, that there's something new that's coming out. Um, once that is set up and you have a proper infrastructure and system that people can come through to train themselves, uh, that is when you can open it up a bit more. And obviously, I think um, the next big step for Kabaddi would be to, um, you know, to get people to play Kabaddi at the Olympics. But there is a criteria for that. The reason it's not in the Olympics is the International Olympic Committee has a rule that a minimum of 55 nations need to play the sport in order for it to be entered into the Olympics. Um, so after the Pro Kabaddi League, I was speaking to Mr. Gellot, who's the chairman of the International Kabaddi Federation. Three more countries have signed up. Um, so you have to you know, keep talking about it, have a, an ongoing tournament and um, a league, which will popularize it more. And uh, that's when more nations, and that's how it's going to popularize. That's how you take it international. Uh, Abhishek, uh, tell us something about your interest in football, a sport that I'm passionate about. I'm a hardcore fan of Kolkata, and because I'm a fan of uh, Shorab Ganguly, and you managed a close draw, so okay, but I'm they not managed sure. a close draw. <laughs> so can you please? I'm half Bengali, by the way, but still. <laughs> Currently, I'm 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 Madrasi, so it's okay. <laughs> um, right. So, um, like I said, um, I studied in a British boarding school since the age of nine. And anybody who's been to a British boarding school knows that, you know, um, it's football first, everything else let rest after that. And um, football is something I've enjoyed watching since I was a kid. Mm. I've followed football since I was a child. Um, I always wanted to do something with football because it's, it's a sport I really enjoy watching. It's a sport I follow very closely. And um, one, of my, one of my dreams um, was to make a difference to Indian sport in whatever way. Kabaddi was the first step in that. So like I say, you know, like uh, it, there's a popular belief that your first child is, is out of love, the second one you think about and you plan. So football was that, planned, was that planned decision to come in and try and make a difference. ISL was happening. Um, I did um, approach them and uh, I, I bought the, the Chennai team. Mm. Um, 
also it kind of what spurred me on was over the summer I was in Brazil for the World Cup and uh, I had the pleasure to meet Mr. Blatter, Sepp Blatter, who's the head of FIFA. And um, he had a wonderful chat and, he's, and he said, you know what's astonishing is 1.2 billion people and you can't put 11 people on a pitch. And that, I'm sorry, but it really pissed me off. You know, I'm like, really, that's but so true. You know, we have no dearth of talent in our country, but there's no system for them to come through. I mean, I live in, in Mumbai and I live right by the beach. And you see some of the boys play football on the beach. It's unbelievable. In, in Kerala, they have brilliant footballers. A lot of the national football players have come from Kerala. There's great talent, but they have no system to come through. You know? Yeah, so let's, let's do something about it. And um, so I think ISL started from a vision of a few people who, who really wanted to make a difference to Indian football. And the main aim for the ISL is that by 2026, we should have an Indian squad in the World Cup. And if by 2026 we don't, then we're doing something wrong. But in order to have a team prepared to play amongst the best nations in football by 2026, you need to start today. I feel it's going to take an entire generation to train and to go through rigorous training to be able to qualify for the World Cup Finals and then go play on that stage. Um, so it all started from, from the want to do this. Um, the majority of the ISL's work actually is happening in what we call the grassroots program. Hmm. Um, there's a mandate to all the franchises that by the end of the second year, they should have had at least a thousand schools, which they kind of adopt, in which they take their children, they train them, and then we have to set up our youth academies, which a lot of them have already started. Kolkata hmm. already has um, Chennai because we're the latest uh, to enter the ISL. We're in the process of setting that up. Um, Kerala has, the Kerala Blasters have a wonderful youth academy that mm -hmm. they set up uh, with David James, who's their coach, and with Sachin. Um, and obviously the idea is to train the youth. You have to catch them young, put them through a program for a good 10, 12 years. If you catch a 8, 9-year-old today, put them through proper training with the best coaches in another 10, 12 years' time, when they're playing senior football, they can represent the country. So that's where the most of the work of ISL is happening. So everybody that got involved in ISL obviously are very enthusiastic about football, but they want to make a difference to Indian football. Okay. So Abhishek, in short, uh, would you describe yourself as an actor first or an entrepreneur first? Um, an actor first, um, always. I think that's my core capability. Um, sports is more passion driven for me than, than anything else. It's just something I really wanted to do, something I believe in. Uh, but acting will always be my first love and, and what I'm always going to do. So you're going to have to handle me for a lot longer. <laughs> okay, so uh, going uh, aside the serious discussion about his entrepreneurship ventures, we'd like to know a few things about you know, the kind of person and the aspirations that you have as an actor. So my first question to you, if you were to feature in a Hollywood movie, which actor would you be uh, you know, like yourself to be featured along with? Hollywood actor. Maybe we should ask them that question, right? <laughs> I find this very tough. I don't know. I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, be slightly arrogant and think that, uh, yeah. I don't know. I really don't know. What about the actress? W what actress would I like to be? Yes. Yeah, I'm fine being an actor. <laughs> Which actress would I like to be? No. What actress, you know, you would like yourself to be featured with? In the oh, featured movie. with? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Audrey Hepburn. I know it's not going to be possible for me, but I absolutely adore Audrey Hepburn. I love Julia Roberts as well. Yeah. So just like your father, classic. <laughs> what kind of roles do you see yourself playing in a Hollywood movie if you were to feature in a Hollywood movie? I've never thought about it. It has to be something that inspires me. Um, I'm not the kind of actor who strategizes a lot, which might, might work against me at times, but I believe that somewhere at the core of what we do, it has to be an emotional decision. It has to be a decision that, um, that your heart tells you. You know, you should do a film because you want to do it, not because it's going to make you the next big superstar. So you have to um, base it on that. So I've never said that I want to do an action film or I'll do a social drama. It has to be a story that really inspires you, a story that, that you want to actually at the end of the day see on screen 
as a viewer. So um, I've never been able to answer these questions. I think it all depends on what kind of role it is. Uh, moving on, Abhishek, uh, I read about you that uh, you know you have a process of you know, dealing with your failures in films, and uh, you know we deal with failures in life always as students, as professors. What would your message be and the takeaway, you know, from your own experience, how to deal with failures in life? Well, I think the most important thing is to accept the fact that you are going to fail. You know, um, what goes up has to come down. Life is going to be filled with failure. Um, and you shouldn't look upon it negatively. I never did. I always looked upon it as, as an opportunity to learn. And I think that's the most important thing. If you open yourself up to, uh, to the, the notion that a failure is not a setback, it's actually an opportunity, uh, then I think you'll be fine. I always wanted to um, use something of mine which did not work according to plan to learn from and to try and improve myself. Um, like I said, you're not always going to get it right. You know, there's no actor on earth who's only made hit films. Everybody's had their fair share of failures, and you've got to learn from that, you know. Um, you can't really run from the wind. You just have to trim your sails and move on. So I think uh, open yourself up to the fact that a failure is not there to set you back. It's actually an opportunity. Uh, given an opportunity, Avishek, and I'm sure a lot of us would like to know this, would you be interested in taking a class at IIM Corico? <laughs> No, I, I, think, I think you have great faculty. I'd love to come attend the class, though. Uh, I, was just being told, I was just being told that you have like five, six day programs. You never know, maybe I'd come okay. back. And... So what course would you be teaching, interested in teaching? I won't teach, I'd like to learn. I'd, marketing, no, no, I'd love to learn about go. marketing, planning, because you don't think Indian films are planned well. So, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, strat strategy um, and marketing. I'm a marketing professor, but anyway. Uh, I'll, I... I'll sit with you after this. <laughs> Uh, what about a course on impression management, Abhishek? Incidentally, that's a course offered by the humanities area over here because certainly you have left a lasting impression on the most beautiful woman in the world. Yeah, since you said she's the most beautiful, I don't think I need classes in that. Ace that, A plus. <laughs> I'll give you classes in that. Uh, all right, before we close, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Uh, Abhishek would be answering, not me for a change. So anybody would like to ask Abhishek a question? Over here? I, I have a question. Can I have a coffee, please? I'm, yeah. Of course. Yeah, Just coffee? You. Just coffee, black coffee. Thank you. Right, fire away, guys. No? I'm that boring? Sir, hi. Mike, microphone. As a faculty, uh, you mentioned that uh, the films are becoming cliche. But uh, is that the only reason that uh, films are not being uh, shot abroad? Or no, no, I, no. I, I thought that uh, most of the time there's a lot of uh, cost saving taking out, and, and places like Switzerland all have already had the sets ready-made sets for uh, Indian uh, cinema. Yeah. But uh, is that, uh, but no, no, that's that's not the only reason. Um, although I, I have to add that a lot of these countries are giving a lot of incentives to come shoot there. They give you a lot of tax cuts, subsidies. Um, so they are giving a lot of incentives to, to cinema in general. Um, especially, say, for example, of late, um, Eastern Europe has really opened up and uh, they're giving a lot of incentives to come. So it's not that. I think it's just more based on what the story requires. Uh, when I first started acting in early 2000s, if you're going to shoot a song, you go abroad and shoot it. It's just, you know, oh, it looks nicer. Um, but because the subjects have become stronger, I feel, and uh, now they don't see the requirement for that, it's purely based on what your story is. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'd like to ask you about the course of You can, but I have no idea where you are. <laughs> so, hi. Um, you know, one of the things that I really want to make a difference to in India is to change a certain mindset that we have, that sports kill good, you know, and sports is not a viable career option. I think with um, the success of many of these leagues coming up with IPL, I mean, look at today, people actually think about becoming a cricketer as a profession. That's because we've proved that there is um, 
a great way to thank you so much. Oh, thank you. so um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. No, no, I'm fine. Thank you. Thanks very much. Would you like some coffee? No. I've got a lot of influence over here. So um, I think um, you know setting up these leagues is going to help change that mindset. And um, if more people are 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 even wanting to study it. I think that's going to make an even bigger impact. Um, so what would be my tips to you? Uh, definitely go ahead, do it. Because uh, I think we need two, three examples um, of people that have gone out, studied this, and made a success out of it. In life, unfortunately, unless you don't make a success out of something, it's um, never really followed greatly. Right? So um, do it. Uh, be passionate about it. Um, you know, in sports, very little happens if you're not really passionate about it. Um, so go out there, do it. I feel there's a huge vacuum, especially in India, in sports management and in entrepreneurship because um, they haven't, we haven't really brought it down to a science yet. In the West, um, if you see, for example, like I've been spending a lot of time with um, a lot of these foreign football teams. It's literally, it's a corporate structure. It's, it's, it's handled like a corporate. Um, so I think... I mean, we still have, I think, a good 10, 15 years till we reach that level. But I think that, that the start has to be with passion for sport. And um, that should be your starting point to, to take off from. Yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, I'm a doctoral student here. So uh, anyway, I want to ask you on adding the question which she asked. Why don't you go forward and have some sports league for females only? Like well, sta starting with females, yeah. not starting yeah. with males. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I'll tell you um, what we're doing in um, halfway through the first season of the Pro Kabaddi League. I sat down with Mr. Mahindra, who's one of the promoters of the Pro Kabaddi League, Mr. Anand Mahindra and Charu, and we're actually working towards starting the first women's Pro Kabaddi League. Um, it's one of the few sports where the level of play between the men and women is almost equivalent. Um, unfortunately, um, perception wise, and financially, these are all big risks, all right? And I explain myself. What I'm saying is, when you're starting something new in the sporting field, everybody seems to think that the men have a higher standard of play than the women. Now, that could be true in certain sports. I mean, physically, men can throw a shot put further than a woman. Fine, okay, that's a physical uh, attribute. Kabaddi is one of those few sports where they're almost exactly the same. I've actually seen the men's senior Indian national team play against the the women's senior, and they actually practice with each other because um, they're almost as good. But because it is an enterprise, because it is a business, somewhere you have to make a start. And I'm okay with that. I'm not here to make a political statement. I'm here to do something for the sport, right? So if I want to do something for women's kabaddi, if that means I have to go through and start up uh, the pro kabaddi league for men and make it a success, so people say, okay, kabaddi is working. Let's see how the women do in it. I'm fine with that as long as your end result is what you want. Uh, so the, the Women's Kabaddi League is something we're working very actively towards, and we hope within the next 18 to 24 months we should have something up and running. And obviously then um, what I want to do in Chennai, we've already started work on that, is in our grassroots program we're encouraging a lot of girls to come in as well, because what I would like is not to start a women's football uh, league, is what I'd like to do is train these children together, the boys and the girls, so that their standards are exactly the same, and then when these people reach their peak, is that's when you start it to prove to people that the women can do it as well as the guys can. Uh, this is good. Oh, thank you. We have to go. I don't, I don't mind staying, by the way. He has to go. He has to go. Uh, may I call on stage Professor Kulpushan Baluni to uh, hand over a memento to our esteemed guest, Mr. Should I remove this?